in this lecture we shall be talking about client server programming in java now if you recall from our last two lectures we had looked at the various features of java we had we had seen that how some of the features of java makes it suitable to be used in a platform independent way as a language which can be used very conveniently over the internet today we shall see basically how to create or how to write network programs in java whereby two java programs over a network can communicate among themselves now you recall earlier we had talked about some of the concepts of client server programming so before we actually go into how we can write such network programs in java let us have a quick recapitulation of our basic concepts on client server programming so let us have a quick recap of the client server model. The client server model as we know is a standard model which has been accepted by many for developing network applications. Now, in this model there is the notion of a client and there is the notion of a server. As the name implies a server is a process or or you can also regard it as a computer in which the process is running. So, a server is such a process which is trying to provide service to other entities which are called clients. So, a client will be a process which may be running on the same computer or some other computer which is requesting some service. As I said in general the client and the server may run on different machines. So, a server will be waiting for request for clients if a request comes the request will be serviced and the server will again go back to serve the next client request. Pictorially the model looks like this you have a server out here and there can be several clients which may be sending request to the server. So, again the way you design a client server programming environment it depends on the kind of service the server is trying to provide to the clients whether the service is definitive in the sense that you can predict how much time will take to serve a request or the request can come in any random order and the times will all be you can say indeterminate you cannot predict beforehand. So, depending on a number of issues the exactly the way how the server should respond to a client request will differ we shall see this later. So, in the, in the client server model if you look at a typical scenario the server process would start on some computer system in fact the server should be executed before the client the server usually makes some initialization and then goes to a wait state or a sleep state where it waits for a client request. Now, after that a client process can start on some machine and whenever it wants some service from the server it will send a request to the server. The server will receive the request will process it and after it has finished processing or providing the service the server will again go back to sleep waiting for the next client request to arrive and this process will repeat as long as the server process is running. So, server process is one which is continuously executing on a machine and it is mostly in the waiting state waiting for a request for the client and whenever such a request comes the server can immediately serve the request and then again go back to the waiting state for the next request to arrive. So, as I said depending on the environment you can have different types of servers. Now, in general if you look at a client program and a server program you will find that there are some differences in the way you write them. So, in that sense 
the client and the server programs or processes are asymmetric in terms of the roles or in terms of how you write. And depending on the environment and the kind of service, you can categorize the servers into either iterative servers or concurrent servers. Let us see the basic idea behind this two. Iterative servers are used when the server process knows beforehand in advance how long it will take to provide a service okay? and the server process directly can handle each of the requests. The idea is that suppose I am the server and if I know exactly how much time I would take to provide a service. And of course, it is also true that the, this total time is not very large, this is within a reasonable limit. Then what I can do as a server that without asking anyone else, I myself can directly serve the request and then again go back to serve the next request. This would be acceptable because I know beforehand how long I would be occupied with processing this particular request and secondly since the time as I said is reasonably less, the next client who also had put up a request will not have to wait for too long a time. Okay. So, in this kind of a server, the characteristics are there is a single copy of the server which runs on the machine at all times and the clients will be sending requests and this single copy of the server will be providing service in an iterative fashion. So, if the server is busy at some point in time, a client sending a request will have to wait until the request has been serviced. In contrast, a concurrent server is more general. This kind of a server you can use when the service time is unpredictable and may be large. So, you can use this when the amount of work required to handle a request is not known or cannot be predicted beforehand. So, here the way the server works is that whenever a request comes, server will start another process dedicated to that request. So, the idea is like this, suppose I am a server now, if a request comes, I shall create another process and I shall ask that process to handle that client request in a dedicated fashion and myself I will again wait back for the next request, go back and wait. So, if the next client request comes again now, I will again create another process and ask that process to handle the second client request dedicated way. So, if there are 10 concurrent client requests, I can create 10 concurrent processes to handle all of them together. So, in this way the server can provide service to a number of clients at the same time simultaneously. So, as I said several copies of the servers are made and a particular copy will cater to a particular client's request in a dedicated fashion, there is no question of sharing. So, if there are n number of client requests, there will be n copies of the server program that will be created. Now, another choice you need to make here that whether you want to use TCP or UDP for your communication. Now, you know the basic you can say differences between TCP and UDP when you should use them. If you want that the protocol itself should handle reliability, flow control, guaranteed order of delivery of the packets, then you should use TCP. But if you have some kind of an application where even if some packets are lost, you do not care or you want that all these services which TCP provides normally, you want to provide them in your application layer, then possibly you can use UDP because in general UDP would be faster because UDP will always try to find out the best path through the network and will try to uh, deliver packets as fast as the network can. 
So, you recall we had said earlier that whenever we establish a connection either using TCP or UDP, there are 5 components that need to be specified before we can say that a connection has been established. The protocol TCP, UDP or, 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 a, or any other proprietary protocol you may be using, you have to specify that. Source IP address and the port numbers, this will uniquely identify the source process. Similarly, destination IP address and the destination port number. These 5 components if you take together, they will constitute a connection. Now, from the concept of connection, the concept of socket emerges. Actually, the socket is a term which was initially coined by the Berkeley software distribution, which actually provided a set of functionalities for inter process communication on the Unix system. A socket basically is used to allow one process to speak to another. The processes may reside on the same link or on, on different links or different machines. Now, as an analogy, uh, opening of a socket is like making a telephone connection. So, once you have a telephone connection, you can simply speak on your handset and the person on the other side will be able to listen. Now, socket using a socket is convenient because once you have opened a socket by specifying all the relevant information, now you can treat the network connection exactly similar to the case as you are accessing a file. Like you are reading or writing from a file, in the same way you can read from a socket or write into a socket. The socket, the way you have created them, that details will be used by the system to automatically handle the network connections that is there underlying. So, socket is some kind of an abstraction you can use at the transport layer level. So, when you are writing your applications or developing your applications, it makes your task simpler. Now, this as I said that when you say a connection is there, the 5 things that we had just mentioned which constitute a connection in the Berkeley software distribution terminology, this is called an association. This 5 tuple is called an association. Now, with respect to a network connection, if you look at the 2 sides of the connection separately, then the concept of socket comes in which is also sometimes called half association. A socket basically consists of the protocol type and the IP address and port number of any one side of the connection either local or remote. So, there will be 2 sockets on the 2 sides, both taken together will be defining the connection. So, now let us look at with this background that how we can create network programs in Java, what are the features and what are the functionalities that the language Java provides for doing such a thing. Now, let me tell you here that you will see that in Java the way we write network programs it is very similar to the way we access files. This is also true for any other programming language like C, C++ whatever language you think of. But in Java, the similarity is much more pronounced in terms of the objects, the methods you use for the purpose. Let us see. So, the basic background says that means when you develop some real world applications, such real world applications will not only rely on data that are available locally on your computer. So, they will typically have to access external data to provide some meaningful service to the users. Java as a language provides a number of libraries and classes to facilitate accessing external data in a number of different ways. Now, there is one common feature here, accessing of external data in Java is handled in a very uniform way. Uniform way means it does not make any distinction 
whether you are reading for a, from a file, reading from a keyboard, reading from a network socket. So, the way you, you basically handle such input or output operations is uniform across all types or all sources of such input or output data. So, in Java terminology there is something called an input stream and an output stream. We define input stream and output stream. Now, the way you define is as follows an object from which you can read a sequence of bytes is called an input stream. Now, as I said this can be a file, this can be the keyboard, this can be a scanner, this can be also a network socket. Similarly, an object wherever you can write a sequence of bytes we call it an output stream. So, when you develop any kind of network or IO applications in Java you are actually concerned about these input streams and output streams how to handle them. So, in Java such input and output streams are implemented using the abstract classes which are available the names of these classes are input stream and output stream. As I said the concept of the input stream we can use to abstract almost any kind of input sources keyboard file network socket or any other. Similarly, an output stream can be used to abstract almost any kind of output devices which can be the screen, which can be a file, it can be a network socket, it can be plotter anything. Java as a language is very rich in providing such input or output capabilities in the sense that it provides a large number of concrete subclasses of input stream and output stream. See input stream and output stream are generic classes for inputs and outputs of bytes. Now, under input stream there can be a separate subclass for networks, a separate subclass for files, a separate subclass for console I O and so on. So, Java provides you with all these facilities of subclasses using which you can write or develop the application in whatever way you want. So, now let us see how in Java we can actually write or utilize these facilities. First let us see the concept of input stream, how we can use the data input stream concept in Java. Now, here the example that we cite is one where an application is trying to read in an entire line of text. Now, when you want to do so, you will have to use a class called data input stream and a method which is there as part of the class called read line. Read line method is used to read one line of text from some input source at a time. Uh, when you say one line it means it will read the characters up to the end of line character, but when it is written back it depends on actually the kind or way you store it whether you actually store the end line character or not. So, just as I said this method will be reading in a line of ASCII text and store it and as I mentioned earlier in Java the characters are stored as 16 bit unicode characters. So, it will be a unicode string. The example shown here actually illustrates how we can read a line of text from a given file. Here you are creating a variable INP of type data input stream. This is a new object you are creating from the class data input stream, new data input stream the kind of data input stream you are specifying here. This is the subclass of input stream, file input stream. File input stream takes a parameter which is the name of the file. File input stream implicitly assumes that the file you are opening that will be opened for input. So, actually when the file is opened you can actually start reading the characters from there. So, the file you are opening you can either use if the file input stream or the file output stream depending on which one you are using 
the file will be either opened as input or output. So, here we are creating this subclass or an object file input stream and after doing that this INP will be the handle or the object that will be returned. You can call read line on this object INP which will be returning a line of characters of type string. Okay. So, as you can see it is fairly simple to read a line of character from any source only you will have to know that what is the name of the subclass you need to use for handling that particular kind of input source. Now, let us see that what are the network programming specific features that are available in Java. As it said before that the language Java has some facilities which are specifically meant for developing network applications. It comes with a very powerful class library for networking that is there as part of java.net package which you have to include in a program if you want to have network input output methods being used. So, java.net is the package which you have to include at the beginning of the program. So, we will show a simple example how we can write a Java program which can communicate over the network. Now, the example which you show next is like this. This particular Java program connects to a particular host over a specified port which means we are actually trying to write a client kind of a program and what the client will do that after connecting whatever the server will be returning it will simply be printing it out on the screen. Okay. So, actually we shall be illustrating how to write a client program which will be contacting a server. Now, one thing you remember whenever a client wants to connect to a server there are two things you need to specify the IP address of the server and the port number on which the particular process on the server need to be contacted. So, this client will be using these two information to establish a connection and after the connection is established the server will be responding back with some string and whatever string comes back will be displayed on the screen. This is what this example will show you. So, the example starts like this you see since this contains some the input stream or output stream. So, I have the java.io package in is included also since we are using some networking functions or method java net is also there. So, here we define a class called connect demo this is a java application we are illustrating not an applet. Okay. This is the main method in main method in the try block we are opening a so called socket using the socket class. Socket is a built in class which if you want to open you will have to specify two things the IP address and the port number. Now, the socket class is to be used by the client program you should remember this because when the client program starts it should start by trying to connect to the server where you will be specifying these two things this IP address and this port number. So, as an example I have taken the IP address as 10.5.18.213 and the port number as 2.2.5. So, you create a new socket and you return it as S this S will be the new socket object. Now, you can use that standard data input stream class this were illustrated earlier for the file example. See here it looks very much the same only difference is I am using S here that means socket. Socket I am opening by calling the get input stream method right. So, this INP is defined to be an object which actually represents an input stream object where the input is taken from this socket we have defined. And since uh, we will be displaying the data coming back, 
So, I am defining a boolean variable more data which indicates that whether there is more data to be displayed or not. So, this is initially set to true. Then just to indicate we are outputting a string established connection saying that the connection has been established. Now, the server is expected to send back some data to the client. So, in this loop while more data you continue doing this you read a line of text using the read line function. If the line is null which will mean that there is no more text to come. So, if line is null you immediately set more data to false otherwise you, you print this line on the screen. So, basically in this while loop you are reading one line if the null is line is null you set the flag to false otherwise you print it. As soon as you set the flag to false next time the while loop will come out and the program will stop. And if during transmission there is some I O error then this exception handler will catch it and this I O error with the error code or message will be printed. So, this particular example is a very simple illustration as to how we can write a client program which can be made to connect to a server and do certain things. Here for example, we have just echoed the message to the screen whatever is coming back. Now, a few things you should remember here when you are developing a network application that all networking code should be enclosed in the try catch block. This will make your application robust in the sense that in case of any error in the socket during the transmission whatever kind of error may be encountered try catch block implicitly will have an ex, will have an exception handler. So, if there is an exception which is raised the exception handler can be used to print a suitable error message through which you can understand exactly what has happened otherwise it will not be possible for the user to know exactly why my application is not running properly what is the matter. Okay. So, as I said most of the network related methods they throw the I O exception this particular kind of exception whenever there is some error in processing right. Now, let us see how we can implement servers the example we have shown that is primarily meant to implement a client. So, as I said earlier that client and server will be asymmetric when you are writing the program there will be some subtle differences in the two the kind of methods you use the way you sequence them they will be different we will see. So, here the server that you write is as follows this server you can actually use in conjunction with the client program you have just written. So, uh, in this particular server after it receives a request from a client it will send back a welcome message to the client then it will expect the client to send some data and whatever data it receives from the client it will simply echo it back one line at a time. Okay. So, the server will be reading one line from the client it will again send it back again read the next line again send it back this will be continued till the next line is null or some delimiter is there. So, this second example looks like this. So, again as usual you have this Java IO, Java net this package is included. This is a simple server this is the name of the class this again is an application with a main method. Now, you see there are some differences you will find between the client program and this particular server program. First thing is that for creating a socket you are using a different object called server socket. In case of a client program you had used the class called simple socket only socket, but here you are using server socket. See server is not trying to connect to any machine, so you need not specify any IP address here. For a server socket it takes only one parameter it is the port number on which the server should wait for a client request to arrive. 
So, server socket has a single parameter only indicating the port number on which it should be continuously listening to. Then there is an accept method which is available under this server socket class. So, soc dot accept if you call this, this will mean by default the server will be waiting, this accept is the function call or method which makes the server wait. The server is waiting till a client request comes, as soon as it comes it will come out of accept, otherwise it will get blocked at that statement itself. Okay. So, after a client request has come only then the server will move on to the next line. So, here the accept will be returning a new socket descriptor, this will contain the detailed information about the client request. So, with this information the server creates an input stream okay, from this new SOC and the object is called INP. And since we will have to send it back echo it, echo whatever is coming, here we are echoing it on the screen print stream. So, there is a similar to data input stream Java has a class called print stream we are using that with the get output stream method on the same socket new sock, we create a print stream object called out p. So, so in p and out p these are the two objects we have created. Then we are printing a welcome message in out p print ln hello enter quit to exit. This is actually being outputted to the socket okay, because out p is associated with that new sock. So, it will not be displayed on the screen, but on the socket. So, the client can receive it on the other side. So, the program is similar boolean more data is true. So, means while this more data is not true, it reads a line of text. If it is a null, it sets the flag to false, else it prints whatever it receives from the server which echoes back with the string from server attached to the line and a new line at the end, you are checking after trimming after omitting the end of line or other or some other white spaces. If it equals to quit this means the last line of the text. So, as soon as you get quit then also you can set the flag to false. So, as soon as one of this uh, these two happens this while loop breaks. And, and when the while loop breaks at that point you can close that new socket which is created. And as usual the exception, exception handler is there, if there is some error in any one of the methods you are using. So, the exception will be catched and the error type that will be returned E will be displayed on the screen. So, this example actually shows you how you can write a simple server program. Now, now in a sense the way we have written the server, this is an iterative server. Well, of course, we have not run the server in a loop. If we make a loop where the server after finishing a request again goes back to the accept to wait for the next client request, this will be an example of an iterative server. Okay. So, only one client request can be handled at a time. So, some points regarding the program out here. Once the accept call is returned, so as the program shows it will be returning an object called new sock. After that on this new sock you can use the get input stream and get output stream to perform the read and write. Right? And the way the program works is that everything that the server program sends to the output stream will become the input of the client and output of the client program will become the input of the server. This is how the program was written. Now, how to run this program or means how to test it? First of course, you will have to run the server, but to test the server the first alternative is that you can write a client program specifically to this server 
just like we had seen earlier how you can write a client program and you can use this client program to connect to the server over that particular port number on which the server was written and the accept call was written to wait for that particular port number. The second alternative is that you know that the telnet command which is there this can also be used to make a connection over a specified port number. So, in the telnet the first parameter will be the IP address or the name of the machine you are doing you are trying to connect and an optional second parameter is there where you can specify the port number. So, if you connect to the server like this then whatever you type after the telnet will go to the server and whatever comes out from the server you can see on the screen. So, this kind of a simple echo server you can very well test using the telnet command on the same machine or on any other machine on the network right. Okay. Now, let us see how we can write a concurrent server which can handle several simultaneous client requests at the same time. Now, in Java there is no direct concept of creating processes because same means when you had uh, earlier seen that how we can do these things in C or C++ kind of languages there we had seen or we had told that whenever you are designing a concurrent server there will be separate copies of the server process that will be created there will be several processes which will be handling all the client requests. But in Java instead of process what you create are called Java threads. Java language supports this thread manipulation you can create multiple threads which work similarly to process of course, a thread is called a lightweight process the overhead of thread switching and thread handling is much less than that of a process. So, for this purpose you can use Java threads. So, the idea is that every time a client will make a connection request in the server the accept call will return. So, what the server will do now at this point the server will create a new thread and will ask the new thread to handle the client connection. However, the main thread which was the original server program will go back to the accept call and wait for the next connection to arrive. This is the basic idea behind how we can write such a concurrent server. Let us see the example that how we can do that. Here the name of the class we have given as thread handler since it uses threads that is why it extends or it is derived from a class thread. Since we are writing a server we have to use we will use a socket we shall uh, see it later. The thread handler this is the constructor class of the thread handler. This is a particular thread handling class. So, the constructor says that whenever you create an instance of this thread this constructor will get executed. This constructor takes two parameters one is the socket on which the thread has to listen or, or has to communicate and second one is an integer number this is just a thread number which is the thread number. So, there are some global variables new sock and n. So, whatever is returned here will be will be assigned to these variables new sock and n. So, basically thread handler serves the purpose of initializing the variables new sock and n to a socket number and the thread number. This is the main method for the thread handling whenever you call it this will be run. So, here what it is doing using the data input stream again using this new sock it is creating an input stream the object name is INP. Similarly, from that new sock again from get output stream it is creating an object out P. Here it is first sending a welcome message just like the previous example this will be going to this new sock okay. then again this boolean variable is set to true 
this part is the same as in the previous program. So, actually what is happening here is that the part of the program that we have seen so far that is just the thread handling class. Whenever you create a thread, the thread will be opening an input stream and an output stream on the socket that you have passed as a parameter and it will be reading the data from the socket and outputting it back, echoing it back. So, this is exactly what every thread will do every time you create a thread, right. This part of the program is the same as the previous one, the remaining part, then the exception handler. Now, here comes the server class, the class that we have seen so far that is the thread handler, but now is the actual server. There is a main method. So, there is a there is a variable which you initialize to 1 and since this is a server you are using the server socket class to define a socket on port number 7500 because all the clients will be sending the requests over port number 7500 this is the assumption. Now, in this loop out here you are calling accept. So, as I said that this accept has to be called repeatedly. So, in this infinite loop the socket is called first and whenever there is a client request it will come out to the next line. So, a message will be printed creating thread you are creating a new thread by creating an instance of the thread handler class we have just seen and as you can see the two parameters you are passing here are this new sock socket number he out here and this n rec which was initialized to 1. So, after starting this thread t dot start where the run method will be invoked you increment n rec by 1. So, that next time whenever you create another thread that will have a number of 2. So, thread number is also maintained right. So, this example shows how we can write a simple concurrent server. Now, the examples we have seen so far these are examples of so called connection oriented server where a client establish a connection the server is waiting for a request over a particular port whenever it comes then they start communicating over that particular socket. This is representative of the TCP mode of communication, but in general we can also have the so called connection less sockets or connection less communication where we are actually using the UDP protocol for carrying out the communication. So, let us see here. So, as it said that the examples we had seen so far they are basically based on TCP which are connection oriented. They provide reliable bidirectional point to point and stream based connection, but now we will see that how we can have connection less transfer which will be using data grams there is no concept of a connection and such communication will be based on the UDP protocol. Let us see so, as it said before such communication using UDP protocol is typically used in situations where you need faster packet communication, where you want to reduce delay and the overhead of explicit data verification in the application layer is justified. Of course, there is a second category of applications where you really do not care if a few packets are corrupted or lost like uh, some real time multimedia data transfer over the net. Suppose you are receiving some voice packets over the network. Now, even if one packet is corrupt there is not much point in requesting the sender to again resend the packet and again play it from the beginning because that will cause an unwanted break in your voice playback, but rather you would prefer that in one of the packet there will be a small glitch in the voice, but the voice remains continuous. Okay. So, in this kind of application also you can use this UDP. 
Now, in Java, you can use UDP pro protocol using two classes datagram packet class and datagram socket class. In the datagram socket class, you are actually creating the socket that is the means for sending and receiving the datagrams. In the datagram packet class, you are actually preparing the packets that means, you can call this as a data container. So, the UDP packets are getting created here and the packets are sent or received. So, datagram packets can be created using the datagram packet constructor which has two different formats. In one, you just specify a buffer and the number of bytes in the buffer size. So, you want to receive data into this buffer whose maximum size is size. In the other format, you specify buffer size all right. Also, you specify an IP address whose data type is INET ADDR and a port number. Now, these two different forms exist because the first form you will use whenever you want to receive a packet, because whenever you are wanting to receive a packet, you need not have to specify the IP address of the other side, because the packet will anyway come to you. But when you are trying to send a datagram packet, you need to specify where you want to send. Okay. So, in the second form, you are explicitly specifying the addresses, the address and the port number. The first form is used to receive data, the second form is used to send data. So, now let us see a simple connectionless server example. Actually, in this example, both the client and servers are together. So, the program is written in such a way that the same program can be used as a client or as a server. When you want to use it as a server, you should call it like this Java name of the program server. If you want to use it as a client, you should call it as Java name of the program client. So, the second parameter is a string which specifies in which mode you want to run this program. right? So, now let us see how this program looks like. So, as usual we have imported the IO java.io package, java.net package and the name of the class we have given as datagram demo. Now, here since we are using it as a client and a server both, we have predefined the port numbers to be used. So, if it is a server, then the server will be listening over port number 7500. If it is a client, then when the client is sending a packet to the server, it will be using port number 7501 as its own port number. Digisoc is a variable you are creating of type datagram socket. And here you are defining a buffer where the data will be stored for transmitting or receiving. This is an array, you are defining an array of bytes of maximum size 512. Now, he, this method is the server, DG server method. So, DG server method will be invoked if it is, if you are running this in the server mode. So, first it outputs a welcome message or uh, uh, just a message that the server starts. PTR is a variable initialized to 0, in an infinite loop it runs. What it does? It reads one character at a time. You see, read line was a method which reads one line at a time. In contrast, read is a method which returns one character at a time. So, you are reading one character at a time, then using a switch statement, you are checking. If it is null, it will return minus 1, then you print exiting and return. Okay. If it is a new line character, that means the, the entire line is already transmitted to you. So, now you are ready to send and in the default case when it is not minus 1, not new line, 
then you store the next byte which is coming into the buffer and increment pointer by 1. But when you have encountered new line which means that the entire line has been received by the server. See the server what it is doing? It is actually waiting and it is expecting some text to be received from the client. So, it is reading character by character till the new line character is received and as soon as it receives it will echo it back to the client by explicitly sending a packet. right? So, that sending of the packet is done by the send method digisoc dot send. Here you are creating an instance of a datagram packet with the four parameters as I said buffer, pointer, the IP address of the local machine this you can get by using the get local host method which returns the IP address of the local machine and the client port which are initialized to 7501. So, this is how the server works. Now, the client, the client is another method whose name is dg client. So, again whenever the client starts you start by printing a message client starts. Similarly, you create a variable or an object datagram packet object and you receive the packet from the server. right? You call digisoc dot receive to receive the packet which the server is sending and then you call system out print ln to print it. So, get data you can get the data from the packet packet dot get length. So, you know how many bytes are there. So, you can use this to print the contents of this packet. So, this is the client and this is the main program. Main program it checks the second argument. So, it, it checks if the number of argument is not equal to 1 then it will say that is wrong number of arguments. Now, arc 0 will be equal to the string that follows the name of the program. So, it can be either client or server. If it is client then it creates an instance of the datagram socket class and it calls dg client and if it is the server then it creates again datagram socket and it calls the dg server. Okay. So, this is how the client and server can be called from the main program depending on the second parameter that was typed in. So, with this actually we have come to the end of our discussion regarding, regarding how we can develop network applications in Java. Now, here we have seen basically all the essential tools and techniques that we require in order to do that. We had seen how you can write a client program using connection oriented technology. We had seen how you can write a server program using connection oriented technology. Both the alternatives we have seen the iterative version and also the concurrent version. Just to recall most of the server programs that we see around us are based on the concurrent version because most of the services have some variability in terms of the in terms of the time they take and in terms of the kind of response the client expects. And lastly we have also seen how we can utilize the connectionless technology of datagrams to send and receive packets. So, now let us look at the solutions of the quiz questions we posed in our last lecture. Why do we need to sometime convert a Java application into an applet? Well, we have seen applet is something which runs along with a web page. So, if we want the Java program to be part of the web page, the existing Java program which you may have will have to be converted into an applet first. What is the purpose of the init method of course, of an applet? The init method is invoked once when the applet is first loaded. Typically all the initializations that relate to the applet are carried out in the init method. 
what is the purpose of the start method? The start method is invoked every time the applet's HTML code is displayed on the screen. What is the purpose of the paint method? The paint method is called to refresh the applet window every time the window is damaged. How can an applet A invoke a method of applet B where both A and B are included in the same HTML page? Well, applet A must first call the get applet context method to gain access to applet A. After that, just using this method, the object that will be returned, you can access all the public variables and the methods available in B. How can we change the displayed image on an applet? This we can do by, by calling the draw image method. We had seen an example in our last class. So, now some questions from today's class, let us see. What is the basic concept behind input stream and output stream in Java? How can you read one line of text at a time from a file called data.in? What are the functions of the server socket and the accept methods? Why do, why do we use them? When would you prefer to have a concurrent server? What are the functions of the datagram packet and the datagram socket classes? So, with this we come to the end of today's lecture. From the next lecture we shall be devoting a few hours on talking about some issues related to network and system security, how we can make our system secure, what are the technologies behind it and so on. And so, we shall be starting discussion on security related issues from our next lecture. Thank you. Now, from today's lecture, we shall be starting some discussions on uh, security issues in computer networks. Now, actually, we shall be talking about a few things. First, we shall look at some of the security infrastructures that you require, then we shall look at some of the low level techniques and technologies that we need to know about, then we shall look at some of the typical applications that have been devised to work on the internet to make transactions safe and secure. The first lecture of the series is titled intranet extranet firewall. So, we shall be looking into these three different kinds of things.